Father, we thank you once more that we can call you Father and we know what that means. We call you Father because Jesus is really your son. And because he's your son, we also can be sons and daughters. We thank you for your message to us in this time. We pray that we may be a help to your people. We all of us have been in a position where we were asleep. We had no idea there was something more we needed to know. Bless us now as you are arousing your people. May we be there to help somebody to awake. Arm us with your only truth in Jesus' blessed name. We have seen clearly that there are two streams in history called the church. Now, most people don't see that at all. They think when you say the church, there's only one church all the way back to Christ, and here it comes. And there may be divergences, but it's still all the church. But that just is not true. Jesus started his church at Jerusalem. He passed the oracles uh, after Jerusalem was di- uh, uh, after the Hebrew nation was divorced from him to the apostles. The oracles went there. From the apostles, it started spreading around the world. But at the same time, Satan says, "I cannot attack Christ anymore." When he died, that was it. We couldn't touch him anymore. And of course, now that he's resurrected and he's in heaven, that makes matters worse. Can't touch him. So what are we going to do about this? We will attack the church. (laughs) His people, the bride. And so Satan set up an elaborate plan to destroy the Christian church. He says, that's the way I will get at Christ. I'll hurt him in a way he can't be hurt another way. And so Satan and his angels got together in a big council meeting and they decided what they would do. And the first thing they realized they had to do was get rid of the word of God. Absolutely corrupted so it's no good. And then he would make the people worldly. He said make them enjoy the world and forget about Christ. And then he made his plans on how he was going to work this all out. And so he established a school in Alexandria. And from that school, he began the counter church. The counterfeit church. So we see we have a true church, the church of the wilderness, and a counterfeit church. It's not the church at all. It's a counterfeit. It's fake. It's false. It's a fraud. So we have learned to see those two streams now. The true stream came through Antioch, Lucian, and the pure Bible through the Walden Seas, all the way to the Reformation. We see this clearly now. But the other stream is just as clear. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Jerome, And it goes through Constantine, Eusebius, the popes, the papacy, all the way through. Now, let's look for a moment at what it was that made the counterfeit church stand out. The first thing they did was begin corrupting the Word of God, of course. And the way they did that at first was to change the Greek of the Apostles. And, of course, they said, we're making it better. The apostles were not trained to write the way we are. We're the scholars. We're the philosophers. They did not understand philosophy. We understand philosophy. So philosophy comes in there through the word, corrupting and changing the meanings. And so we have two Greek New Testaments now, the apostles and the false one through Alexandria. Okay. So now we see those two lines developing using a false New Testament. 
And it's easy to trace that all the way through. Now, the problem that arises is that God at a certain point in time begins to bring the pure church out in the open again. And it was called the Reformation. Now, the problem here is that the people today don't understand what happened at the Reformation. At the Reformation, Luther and all the rest of us, Zwingli, Calvin, and so forth, they brought back justification through faith in the merits of Jesus. That is the truth. But they did not leave Catholicism. And because they did not leave Catholicism, they said justification is all we need. Now, the pioneers of the Reformation movement did not say that. It was the second generation after them that said that, because Luther knew that faith without works is dead. Okay, and so did the rest of the Reformers. But the second generation that came after Luther and Calvin and all the rest of them were dead, they changed it, and they said all we need is justification there's no, no such thing as sanctification built in for salvation. So just believe. And they ruined the Reformation. And from there, the Reformation went downhill because the Catholics got on that and they said, Ah, oh, we have them. They don't understand what they said originally. And so the Catholics started the Counter-Reformation. And that's another whole history that we haven't touched. But here we see that the Reformation went down. And so that which God started to get away from Catholicism never happened. So what do we find in history now? Alexandria said the Sabbath is a feast day. It's part of the ceremonies. We don't need that. So the false church began saying, the Sabbath is no good. So they made Sunday. So Sunday is one of the big features of the false line. From Sunday, they picked up their immortal soul from Plato. Okay? So... The natural immortality of the soul becomes a part of that, that line. And from there they started doing all kinds of things. So that that line today can be identified by saying, who keeps Sunday? Well, it's the people that never completed the Reformation. They're deceived. Okay, so the deceived ones keep Sunday instead of the Sabbath. Now, this is all pretty easy for us. We know these things historically. We know them biblically. But there's more. They also believe in the natural immortality of the soul. They also know nothing about the 2300 days. They do not know about the high priestly ministry of Jesus in the most holy place. They don't know. It goes on. The list is big, what they don't know. And the things they believe are all deceptions. Even justification by faith is a deception, the way they teach it. And they teach a thing called righteousness by faith, which is also a deception. And I don't want to spend a lot more time pointing out that the, the deceptions in this false line of Christianity that never did the Reformation. So God had a problem here that he knew he was going to have to deal with. He put it in the Bible. He was going to do it. Revelation, the 10th chapter. Revelation, the 11th chapter. The 12th chapter. The 13th chapter. The 14th chapter. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise a people to do the Reformation and get completely out of the Catholic Church which the Reformation never did. Now, we read a long time ago that James White said, we have 
just one thing against the Reformation. They did not come completely out. They kept this and this and this. And in the middle of his list, he says, the Trinity. That's what our men knew who were going to do the Reformation. You have to get rid of the Trinity. Do you see how that fits now, his little quotation? So all of our pioneers knew we have a job to do. It's to get out of Catholicism and bring Christianity back in its completeness. And part of that is not all the false doctrines we know they teach, but also the Trinity. We have to get rid of that. That is not taught by anybody in our system today in this way. They believe the pioneers are mistaken and were confused by the churches that they came out of. That's what they teach. But the pioneers knew exactly what God expected of them. Leave Catholicism because it's part of a fake system of religion. Well, that doesn't seem to be a high priority today to leave Catholic ideas. As a matter of fact, you have to listen real hard to ever hear anything about the second angel's message at all. I need to be careful about some of the things I say here because we have not built a background for some of the hard statements. I'll just say this. Wherever the Jesuits have gone into Protestantism, those churches stop saying bad things about the Catholic Church. That is a part of what you can see. Where they have been, there's no longer criticism of the Roman Catholic Church and its system. Now, Let's look at this a little more carefully now. We see the Sunday-keeping world of today fits exactly the mold of what we've been looking at. They are in the counterfeit side of Christianity. So, today, in all of these systems that go back to origin, what do they call their God? It is not the God of the Apostles, the only true God, the Father, and His Son, whom He said. All the systems that come out of origin, and Clement, and Justin Martyr, and all of them, have, their God is the Trinity, three in one God. Now, don't you think it might be a little bit strange that the Seventh-day Adventist people have given up the non-immortality soul. They don't believe in Sunday. They don't believe they have left go all the doctrines because they're the Reformers. But they have chosen to keep the Sunday God. Now, it took me a while to realize what that might mean. The devil knew he could not make Seventh-day Adventists give up the Seventh-day Sabbath. He knew that. He knew the Bible's too clear on the non-immortality of the soul. He knew the 2300 days. He knew. He knew all of this. He says, well, let's forget all of those things. Let's not even think about them. Let's not work on those. Let's not try to get them to shift their gears on that one at a time. Let's just go for the big one. Let's get them to serve the wrong God. And you're, that's really pretty smart, isn't it? Forget all the doctrines. Get them to serve the wrong God. And that takes care of the problem. So do I need to say more about where this has been going all this time? Here we are today. And who of us still doesn't feel some pain to think that the church we thought was the remnant church teaching the full truth of God has this kind of a history and we can see it now. We we can look at it and know it's true. This is what's happened. And it puts everybody in a terrible, terrible position. Where do you go? 
when the only true church of God apostatizes. Where can you go? Well, we have to learn something. There is no man organization that we can go to. There just isn't. Because when you have left what God established and they ruined it, there's no place left. So where do you go? Well, he's teaching us something. I don't know if we're learning it yet. There's only one place to go. It's to Jesus. There's no place else. Jesus. And we must be satisfied with Jesus. Ellen White said he satisfied all our wants. And do you know what that means? That means we don't need any sin to get satisfaction because we have Jesus. That takes care of sinning. So that's what Jesus is trying to bring us. To Him so we don't need anything else. Or at least we don't think we do. Because that's our real problem. We are, have all been deceived into thinking, oh, I have to have that. Oh, I have to do that. Oh, I need this. And all the lies we tell ourselves. And so Jesus says, well, let's one at a time, let's allow yourself to learn that everything's going to be taken away from you. Everything. Every earthly support is going to be pulled away from you. So you finally get to me and you realize, I'm the only one that can help you. And you know what the horrible thing is? He has allowed even the church to be taken away from us as an organization. And none of us ever thought that could ever happen. But here we are today looking at the horror of the history of the world and Ellen White says that when the, the founders of religious systems begin, they usually have light. She says, but when they die and the next generation comes, it goes away. And she says, it must always be so. Well, who am I to argue with that? It must always be so. Why? Because the second generation are not the first generation. They don't know what they're doing. The first ones heard God. The second generation hears man. And that's the way it is. And we can prove it in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Ellen White did not have a creed while she was alive. The church did not have a creed while she was alive. When she died, we developed a creed. We had no church manual. When she died, they made a church manual. And I could make you a list of all the things we did not have as a people while she was alive, but now we have them to keep the organization at the top of everything. So enough said. That's our introduction for today. We now know there are two lines, and one is the truth, and one is counterfeit. And we can see who the counterfeit is very easily in that, just with what we've done. Now, the counterfeit system has developed always through history, through the scholars. Did you get that word? Because scholars, quotation marks. It's the schoolmen who have consistently ruined what God has tried to do in this world. So God has always gone to the people who did not count themselves as scholars. Who were the twelve apostles? Not a single one of those was a rabbi. Fishermen. Yeah, tax collector. Uh, you know the list. God could not use the smarties. He never has been able to use the people who think they know things without the Spirit of God. And the problem is they gave away the Spirit of God and made a new deity instead. But that's not our subject today. We want to understand where did the schoolmen first 
go to destroy the true church and that they didn't think that's what they were doing. They thought they were being smart and making it better. <laughs> but of course, their better was through man's reasoning instead of through the Spirit of God telling them. Because he already told them in the Word. But they didn't like the Word, so they changed it. <laughs> to say what they wanted it to say. And of course, after that, it's stupid. There's nothing for them to rely on. So let's look at what they did first. It's the first three words of the Bible. The very first three words. They could not get past the three words. And they fixed it so that today scholars can't get past the first three words. They can't do it. So what are the first three words? Barashith. Bala Elohim. Those are the first three words of the Bible. The first word, Bereshit, is actually two words in the beginning, in English. In the beginning, Bereshit. The second word, Bala, is the word that means create. And the third word, Elohim, is a word translated in the King James as God. Those three words, as written by Moses, tell us the truth. But the truth is not what the counterfeit church teaches. So let's see what the difference is. What did Moses write? In the beginning, we don't need to worry about that for now. We want to look at the two words, bara and Elohim. The word bara is a verb. Now, verbs have characteristics that you can study so you know what comes next. This particular verb in the Hebrew is a cal perfect, which just means it happened in the past. So now we're not saying create, we're saying created. Okay? In the past. So the word says created. And it also tells us who created. It is a masculine. He. Singular. That means it's a he. So we know now it's cre he created in the past, and he is one person. Masculine, singular. Okay. Now, we'll leave that for now. Let's look at the next word. Elohim. Now, here's where all the people who think they know Hebrew says, Aha, we've got you now. Because they notice, and this is true of all the seminary professors also, they say there's an I am in this word, which means it's a plural. Well, in the Hebrew language, an I am is a plural form. That's true. But we have a problem in these three words, especially these two words, the verb and the noun. In the Hebrew language, the verb always determines what the noun is, whether it's singular, masculine, feminine, and so forth. Now, the verb bara is masculine, singular. So according to the rules of Hebrew grammar, which Moses did not Listen to, he formulated them. <laughs> he made them. So he, maker of the rules, followed what he wanted to do, but something's wrong here. One word is singular, and the other word is plural. That's not possible in Hebrew. But that's what Moses wrote. So what is going on here? Well, the people in the wrong line say, well, it's perfectly obvious. Since God is a plural, it's talking about the Trinity. And they all teach that. 
based on this problem. But of course that's not the answer. Because nobody's going to convince Moses that he believes in the Trinity. You can't find it anywhere in his writings. So he had something else in mind when he wrote this. We must discover what it is he did when he did that. Now, if Moses was going to call this Elohim a plural form and a plural being, he'd have to say, they, not he. The verb says he. So they don't match. They do not match. The King James translators, if they knew Hebrew the way the Sunday scholars say it today, they would have said in the beginning, God's created. See? Because that's what they're trying to tell us today. God's created, that's why it's plural. But then they can't finish their sentence because they say, well, we don't really mean God, that's polytheism. We, we mean three in one God, so we still have one God. But that's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. So why is this word in the plural? The word singular for God is Eloha. Why did Moses write Elohim? Well, there's a very simple reason, and the Jews understood this. They had no problem with it. You ask any Hebrew who understands the Jewish thought forms, the religion, and the language, and they will tell you, Elohim means God who is one is more than one. He is above everything. He is, at the same time, all. Oh, <laughs> that is a plural form. God is more than one. <laughs> but he is one person. But that one person is almighty. And the word Elohim, in all the lexicon, says this word means the almighty supreme God. See? So the word Elohim was picked by Moses to show when you say Elohim and you say God, you're saying God is not just one person among many. He is <laughs> beyond everything. He's greater than all. He is more than, than just the sum total of one. He is almighty. He is before everything. And he's, he's bigger than everything in his, in his status, in his being, and his capacities. Now, we can say this another way. Once we know what Moses is saying, that this one being created in the beginning, that means there was nothing before him. Now, if there was nothing before him, he must have always been. And if he's always been, he is unbegotten. He's the only being in all eternity that is all these things because he is God. He is Elohim. There's nothing bigger or mightier than him. He is beyond control. Isn't that an interesting idea? He is beyond control. Nobody can control him. He. He is the sovereign. Now, that's exactly what Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets. The sovereign of the universe had a co-worker. But there's only one sovereign. There were not two of them. The sovereign had a co-worker. Well, you know, in Genesis 1, we now know who God is based on the word bara. You don't go to Elohim. You have to go to bara. And bara says it's a he, masculine plural. No, it's masculine singular, excuse me. Masculine singular. So Elohim has to be singular. Now, in verse 3, it says, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now here we see the word spirit for the first time. 
Well, we see that the, the counterfeit line can't possibly understand what Moses was really saying. The Jews called the word Elohim the plural of majesty. That's what they call it today. That's what they've always called it. I'm going back to the days of Moses. It's the plural of majesty. It doesn't mean two people. Or three or four. It's one person, but that person is so important. It's a plural form. Now, do we see that today? Of course. The kings, queens of the countries, when a king of a country speaks, he says, we would like you to know <laughs> that we are going to raise the taxes. You're going to pay them. But we say it's for the good of the country. <laughs> That's the plural of majesty. That's the way kings talk. We! There's only one king. But, but he uses the plural form for himself. That's what Moses did for God. God is the supreme being and we address him in the plural form. When he talks, he can say, we, because there's no other, just him. Okay, now, when it comes to the word spirit, let's see what they did with that. They ruined the first three verses, the three words. Let's see what they did with the word spirit in verse 3. I had a couple of ministers sitting here in that room telling me the Spirit, that's the first use of the term Holy Spirit in the Trinity. And I just looked at them and said, you know, <laughs> you're sure adding a whole bunch to that verse because it doesn't say any of that. And they said, what? I said, I know every Seventh-day Adventist minister in the world teaches that's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. I said, but it's not in the Bible that way. And you can't make it come out that way in that verse. And they just looked at me. They didn't know what to say because they never heard anybody talk like that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Well, let's look at this word spirit. The word in the Hebrew is ruach. The word ruach, according to all the concordances and the lexicons, means breath, wind, spirit. Okay? Now get that in your mind. The word in Genesis that Moses used right after he told us who God is, he's one person within a plural form to show how great he is. Now he uses the word spirit. He says God's spirit. So the spirit is from God. That's plain and simple. Unless you're a Trinitarian, for some reason you can't see simple things anymore. Spirit. Spirit of God. The Ruach of God. Okay, let's forget the English word for now. Let's look at the Hebrew word that Moses uses. The Ruach of God. The, the breath of God. Why do you breathe? To stay alive. The breath of God has something to do with his life, his living force. The breath of God. Well, let's not use that one. Let's use the next one. Wind. The wind of God. Well, that's the same as breath, isn't it? Well, of course. The wind is a dynamic. It means the breath is doing something. It's moving. So we're still talking about the life of God. It's his dynamic life. Spirit. Well, whatever spirit is, it has to be the same thing as these two. Spirit is the wind and the breath. So spirit is the life of God. Spirit, wind, breath, all say the same thing. And Moses said, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, the wind, the breath, the life force. But you can't see breath. You can't see wind. You can't see. Uh, what was Moses trying to say here? Because obviously there was something going on that could be seen. Well, we won't get to that yet. There are other uses in the English of these words. Wind, breath, spirit. When you see them in the Hebrew way, the word spirit 
when I say your spirit or your spirit or your spirit, you don't think about a different person, do you? Nobody does that. You can even say the spirit of Satan and nobody thinks Satan has a different person. It's Satan himself. But for some reason the Trinitarians get away with saying the spirit of God and people say it's a third person. Oh, wait a minute. Where does it say that? Where does it say that? It's not in Genesis. Whatever we need to know is in Genesis. Now, when I say your spirit, everybody's going to understand what I say. I'm talking about your attitude, your character, your personality. Oh, did you hear that word, personality? The spirit is the personality of God. Now you know why Ellen White changed the word in her original manuscript when she said the spirit, of, the person of God. She changed it. She said the personality of God because that meant what she was trying to say. It has to do with him, who he is, and his personality. It didn't mean another person. She never said that there was somebody different from God, and that's God too. She never said that. Now, I'm not talking about Jesus, because she always refers to him as the Son. There's no problem. So, let's look at Genesis 1-3 again. After Moses said, He, singular, God, Elohim, created. Then it says how? His spirit moved upon the face of the waters. His character, his personality, his, his life force. But he didn't do it. Who did it? Jesus. So the Father's personality is seen by his Spirit through his co-worker. And that's all we know to call him at this point in time. Because it's only later that we find out that Jesus is that co-worker. But in Genesis 1, there are two. In verse 27, let us. Make man in our image. So now we know there are two beings. In verse 1, there's only one. In verse 2, there's still only one, but we see his personality, the spirit. And it's working through something. In verse 27, we see that something or somebody is, is another being. Because that being is also like God. Because God says, let us. There's an equality built in there someplace. Mm. Let us make. They are both makers. So, just in three verses, we have the truth. And there's nothing about Trinity in that. If you see what's really happening, according to what Moses wrote, what he meant, and what the Hebrews understood for 15 centuries, and still do today, as a matter of fact. There's no Trinity in chapter 1 of Genesis. Now, to be sure we're getting this, let's go to the New Testament. John 20. And by the way, if this went by a little quickly, you can look this stuff up on the web. Just don't look up Trinitarians if you want to know the truth, because they all tell you something that's not right. You must find a person who is a Jew, who knows the Hebrew religion, knows the Hebrew history, and knows Hebrew. And you go see what they say about Genesis 1. And you're going to get the three words the way they're supposed to be. And you will find they say the same thing we just went through here. So it's on the web if you want to know. Alright, John 20 verse 22. 21 first. Then said Jesus. Unto them, peace be unto you. Now listen carefully to his next words. You know the words. Listen to them. What is he saying? As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Do you hear it? As the Father sent me, 
Jesus didn't say, in my equality with God, I sent myself. No, he said, the Father sent me. That means he's subordinate to the Father. The Father is subordinate to who? No one. The Father has no control. No one can control him and tell him what to do. Not even Jesus can tell the Father, I command you to do this. But the Father commands Jesus. I have kept my Father's command. So here is Jesus saying all that. As my Father, does Jesus have a Father? The scholars say he doesn't. Well, why did he say it then? Does Jesus not tell the truth? Did Jesus make it up? Is he trying to fool us? What's going on here? Well, I think it's really quite simple. To anybody who has any common sense, he was telling us the truth. He has a father. <laughs> As my father sent me from where? From heaven. So, the father was the father of Jesus before he came here. And people are trying to say that Jesus is only the son after he becomes a human. That is not biblical. Jesus said, my father, while I was in heaven, because I was his son then, he sent me. And I came because I volunteered to come, and I followed his command. So Jesus comes. But then he says, so... I send you the same process. I am your God. And you are my subordinate. And when I give a command, you obey because you love me. There's no other reason. So as I did it with the Father, you do it with me. I was a son to the Father and still am. And now you be a son to me in the same way. In the same way. Now if Jesus is not our example, how do we know what to do? There's just bunches of stuff in that scripture. I don't know how many times we've read these kinds of scriptures and we don't think about it because we think there's not, nothing too much important. We got the message. The Father sent him. He sent the disciples. Well, there's more than that. Now let's read the next verse. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Oh, he what, what? What did he do on them? He rocked on them. Breath, wind, spirit. Now in the Greek, the word is pluma. And it means exactly the same thing in the Greek. Breath, wind, spirit. So it doesn't matter which language we're looking at. It means exactly the same thing. Jesus breathed his wind, his spirit on them. And he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now where did they get it from? Another God? Did another God show up here and say, oh, okay, here I am. Let me, let me uh, be in that breath and get on you. Uh, come on. I've never heard anybody say anything like that. How could they make that stick? It says Jesus breathed on him. Well, where did that breath come from? Himself. It came from inside of him. <laughs> did, does he breathe with his fingers? Of course not. Did he wave his arm? I don't say here, I'm breathing on you. But he breathed on His life, his breath went to them. His spirit. There's nothing Trinitarian in this statement. Nothing. As a matter of fact, it's against the Trinity. Jesus in this statement is a non-Trinitarian. Now, I think that's a pretty good person to follow. And if I'm wrong, I'd rather be wrong with Jesus than wrong with somebody else. So here we see something absolutely fantastic. As my Father sent me, first He gave me His Spirit. 
And now that's the way I send you. First, I have to give you my spirit. Did you see that? Did you see that? Great Controversy 477. God gave Jesus his spirit without measure. And that's what it says in John. The spirit of God without measure was in Jesus. So here we have Bible truth just hitting us. This has nothing to do with the counterfeit, counterfeit churches and the systems that teach the Trinity. God, Jesus doesn't teach the Trinity. As a matter of fact, you can read the whole Bible, and because he's the author of the whole Bible, he never taught us. And Ellen White says, we may safely discard that which Jesus did not teach. Well, I sure feel safe. I feel very safe. So now, we see that Genesis 1 is telling us the truth, the way Rose, Moses wrote it, the Spirit of God. That is the one he gave Jesus. His breath, his life. And that's what Jesus gives us, his breath, his life. We partake of his nature. Now, so we've got it in the Old Testament in the very first three words. We've got it in John, the 20th chapter. Now let's see about the spirit of prophecy. Which line do you suppose she's in? You think she's with those counterfeits who teach the Trinity as we're being taught today? Or is she in the Bible? Let's read. Review and Herald, June 13th, 1899. And the articles, some of what I'm going to read with you today are so heavy. You go read them because I can only hit a couple sentences here and there. You need to read the entire context of all of these things. They're beautiful. I'm going to read a little bit more than the context here so you see. Remitting sins or retaining applies to the church in her organized capacity. God has given directions to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Censure is to be given. This censure is to be removed when the one in error repents and confesses his sin. The church has no right to censure a person unless they have open sin. What is the sin? It's against the commandments of God. Now, I'm saying this to you because you all have been through the process. You've seen it where a church chooses to censure, and it has no right to censure unless a person is sinning. Now, what is sin? It's transgression of the law, isn't it? What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no gods beside me. Singular. It is not a sin to believe in the Father as God. So why does the person get censured? It's because it's the church that's sinning, not the person who believes God is one true God. You see the problem we're having? Yes. Now let me keep reading here. This solemn commission is given to men to do censure. It's given to men who have in them the breath of the Holy Spirit, in whose lives the Christ life is manifested. Do you see who gets to do censure in the name of the church? Only those who have the breath of Jesus in them. The Ruach, the wind, the Spirit of Jesus. They are to men who have spiritual eyesight, who can discern spiritual things, whose actions in dealing with the members of the church are such as can receive the endorsement of the great head of the church. If this is not so, in their human judgment they will censure those who should be commended and Sustain those who are controlled by a power from beneath. Now, I don't say these things. I can't say them. I'm only reading. This is Jesus talking. 
This is what he says. The gospel commission is to be carried out by men who know the inward working of the Spirit of God, who have the attributes of Christ. Christ's breath is breathed upon them, and he says to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, it's important that we listen to men who have this when they censure people who are openly sinning in the church. That needs to be done. But when they censure the people who bring the truth of God to them, they're not the ones that Jesus has breathed on. Okay? So John 20 becomes a very important way of knowing who the true church is and who the apostolic church is. See? And I mentioned the Ten Commandments because the false church does not follow the Ten Commandments. They just give it lip service. The true commandments of God say, Thou shalt have no other gods besides me, the Father. The Father. That's what Paul tells us. So, we say we're the commandment-keeping church. Where? We don't even keep the first one. And Luther said, if you don't keep the first one, you don't keep any of them. So we have a system of people who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists who think they're keeping the Sabbath, but they can't while they're violating the first commandment. Now, this is a much big, bigger problem than any of us have ever imagined. But God sees it all, and he's trying to get us to understand as we are able. All right, let's. Let's look a little bit more here. 4 B.C. 1166. I'll get to the minute here. It's hard for me to work with these computers. Now this little section in 4 B.C. is about Ezekiel 37. Now we all know what Ezekiel 37 is, don't we? The valley with the dry bones, dead people, nothing there. There was not only no spiritual life, there was no life at all of any kind, just bones. <laughs> okay. So God is telling Ezekiel what it's going to take to make people into Christians. They're going, he has to work with dry bones. Dead, dead people, dry bones. He said, now Ezekiel, this is your problem in trying to get a person to become a Christian. Tell those bones to raise up. Oh, and Ezekiel said, oh, wait a minute, what's happening here? So in 4 BC it says, it is not the human agent that is to inspire with life. So now you know what your problem is when you try to tell people about the real God and the real spirit of God. You can't do it. You can only give them something to read. And only God can do it when he shows them. So don't get all frustrated when you talk to people and they're not getting it. You can't do it. The Lord God of Israel will do that part. Quickening the lifeless spiritual nature into activity. The breath of the Lord of hosts must enter into the lifeless bodies. The breath? Did you say the breath? The Ruach of God in Genesis 1. See, so yeah, the Bible never, never switches its ground. It's always the same. And the Spirit of is the same. She never switches her ground. No matter how many ministers tell you today she changed her mind, she never did it. And every minister that I hear from today is saying that untruth. It's absolute falsehood. And the only reason they're saying it is they heard somebody say it they trusted at the seminary because they never studied for themselves. If they would read the Spirit of Prophecy, they would say, she said she never changed. And if they need a page, anybody who's listening, volume one, selected messages, page 35. Okay, that's one. And it's many times she said this. Series B number two, series B number seven. Hey, go looking. She said she never changed. The breath of the Lord of hosts 
In the judgment, when all secrets are laid bare, it will be known that the voice of God spoke through the human agent and aroused the torpid conscience. Now you know what's happening when you talk to somebody. God is trying to talk through you. So we have to maintain the proper spirit so His voice can be heard talking through us even if they like it or not. doesn't matter. It's His voice. Because it's His Word. Now here's the other thing. Don't say your words. Say His words. When you speak His words, the power is there. When you say somewhere I read and then you put your paraphrase, forget it. Nobody's going to pay attention to you. They don't need to. They're going to get in trouble if they listen to you. God's words. And if you don't know His words, then carry them with you so you can read them. But don't say your words. They're no good. In the judgment, when all secrets of Lord bear be none, the voice of God spoke through the human agent, aroused the torpid conscience, and stirred the lifeless faculties, and moved sinners to repentance and contrition and forsaking of sin. It will then be clearly seen that through the human agent, faith in Jesus Christ was imparted to the soul, and spiritual life from Heaven was breathed upon one who was dead in trespasses and sins. What was breathed? Spiritual life. She said that. How can we mistake that? It's not enough that there is symmetry of limb and feature. The breath of life must vivify the bodies that they may stand upright and spring into activity. These bones represent the house of Israel, the church of God. Now, she didn't say this represents the heathen outside the church. She said, these, these old dry bones represent the church. And the hope of the church is the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God. Not another person, not another being, not another God, but God the Father Himself. And he, since He doesn't come personally, He sends Jesus. So the only Holy Spirit we know about on a one-to-one -one is the Spirit of Jesus. Okay? The Lord must breathe upon the dry bones that they may live. Who? The Lord. <laughs> The Lord. She, she always is saying things we miss and we don't know the truth. We don't even see them. But there it is. The Spirit of God with its vivifying power must be in every human agent. That every spiritual muscle and sinew may be in exercise. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God. Now, she just said what the Holy Spirit is. The breath of God is the Holy Spirit. How can anybody say, oh, that's a third deity? Standing over there and God's over here. It just doesn't work. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there's torpidity of conscience, loss of spiritual life. Many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records. But they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may be joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. Now, I want you to see something in that little... Little claws there. They are not united to a third God. Did she say that? They are not united to what the Trinitarians call the Holy Spirit, deity, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. She did not say that either. She said united with the Lord. That's the only person we're united with when we become Christians. It's with Jesus. We don't need anybody else. We don't need this thing people call the Holy Spirit because they're mistaken. They're calling the Holy Spirit a different person from the Father and the Son. No, the Holy Spirit we receive is 
from the Father to the Son to us. That's the only Spirit, Holy Spirit there is. And Ellen White says it many, many, many times in her 25 million words. She never says something different than this. Never. Unless there is genuine conversion of the soul to God. Unless the vital breath of God quickens the soul to spiritual life, unless the professors of truth are actuated by a heaven-born principle, they are not born of their incorruptible seed which liveth and abideth forever. As I was passing through that room this morning, there was something flashing on the television set. It was blinking. I was wondering, what's it saying? It said, are you born again? Well, what is the person supposed to answer? Anybody who sees that is going to say, well, of course I am. I'm at the church. I'm a Christian. But are they born again according to God? He said, you're not born again until you receive my breath in you. And that becomes incorruptible seed in you. First John, the third chapter. Unless they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security. Not what I believe, not my faith. The actual righteousness of Christ unless they copy his character, his spirit, and labor in his spirit, they are not good. Did she say in his spirit? That's what she said. Labor in his spirit. They are naked. They have not on the robe of his righteousness. The dead are often made to pass for the living. Ooh, she just said that before. That's the church members. The dead are, are often... <coughs> Made the pass for the living. For those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas, is that the Trinity? Have not God working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure? This class is well represented by the valley of the dry bones, Ezekiel saw in vision. So now we have another thing that God has told us about what's going on in the church today. Dry bones, that's what's going on. And the only solution is to get the breath of God. His Spirit. Not a Trinity thing. The Spirit of God Himself, the Father through the Son. You might want to read that carefully sometime. Um, Desire of Ages, 805. You might also want to read Spirit of Prophecy on it. She says more over there. This is this is for the non-believers, this one. This is for the popular reader. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The Holy Spirit was not yet fully manifested. For Christ had not yet been made, been glorified. Do you see how she ran that sentence together? The Holy Spirit, let's read it this way. The Spirit of Christ had not been fully manifested because he hadn't been glorified yet. That's what she just said. The more abundant impartation of the Spirit did not take place till after Christ's ascension. She said more abundant. She didn't say for the first time. Because Jesus was on the earth and his spirit had been working for a long time. Not until this was received could the disciples fulfill the commission to preach the gospel to the world. But the spirit was now given for a special purpose. Before the disciples could fulfill their official duties in connection with the church, Christ breathed his Spirit upon them. Now, how could she say it any plainer? He breathed his spirit. She didn't say he breathed another person on him. This is amazing. Here in the book, everybody used it to prove in one sentence that she changed her mind. Here on page 805, which is a long time after page 530, she 
says Jesus breathed His Spirit upon them. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. She did not say the Holy Spirit is another deity. She didn't say it. She never says it. Here's what she said. The Holy Spirit is the breath of life for Jesus in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. You know, you have to start wondering, has nobody read this book? I had another minister sit in that chair. We were talking about this hour of ages. He said, yes, I read the one the Pacific Union sent out to all the ministers. And I said, yes, I know that book. They changed it. They changed it to me. Instead of the King James, they put modern versions in it. I said, you read that book? He said, yes, it was such a blessing. So I proceeded to read him a couple paragraphs on it. He says, where is that? What book is that? He had no idea what he read. He didn't even recognize it. And I know why, because they changed the book. You can't change Ellen White's writings and come out with something. Just change a couple words, you're in trouble. In Steps to Christ the other day, I ran into a book that they sent out in modern English, Steps to Christ. That's what they call it, Steps to Christ in modern English. Now, I don't know what was wrong with Ellen White's English, but they say in modern English. So I started reading. You know, I didn't get past the first sentence. The first sentence in Steps to Christ says, God is the source of all things. The word source is gone in the New Steps to Christ. It's not there. They took it out. So you don't really know what Ellen White said. They changed it. We better stay with the books she wrote, the way she wrote them. And it's getting harder to do because they keep making new editions. Find the old editions, whatever you can. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues. What it? What it? Who's it? The Holy Spirit. She calls the Holy Spirit it. Not he, him, a person. It. And Lacey didn't like that. Do you remember? And most people still haven't figured out why she calls the Holy Spirit it. Because it isn't it. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> it imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. Only those who are the child of God, those who possess the inward working of the Spirit and in whose life the Christ life is manifested are to stand as representative men to minister in behalf of the church. Now you just ask yourself the question sometime, how many ministers in our church believe the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ that He breathed on them? And if you were to tell them that, what would they do? What spirit would they manifest? Signs of the times, October 3rd, no, 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 I'm, I'm at a place here, I'm going to go there first, General Conference Bulletin, I see my computers on that, let's see where we go, General Conference Bulletin, October 1, 1899, by the way, there are two October 1's in the CD, so you have to... Find the second one. God saw that the world was destitute of true knowledge and he, who? Who he? God, he sent Christ into the world. Father, Son, the one who cannot be controlled, who no one controls sin, sent his son. There's a subordinate one. So there's two different people here. And one is subordinate to the other. That's very clear in this cloth. 
He sent Christ into the world to live the law and represent him. This was the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is not God in this sentence. They're two different people. The knowledge of God John 17, 3, the knowledge of God was the chief treasure Christ brought to man. So God came to this world to show that God is this one person in heaven we call the Father. Who believes Him? That's why He came to this earth. Was to show that there's somebody in heaven called God. The Father. All right, jumping down. Jesus gave his life to make it possible for men and women to secure eternal life. The Father appreciates every soul whom his Son has purchased by the gift of his life. The bounties of God's providence speak to every soul, confirming Christ's testimony to the supreme goodness of his Father. Christ's testimony? His testimony is that there's a supreme. And it's not me. It's the Father. And if you want goodness, you go to the Father. You remember that man that said, Oh, good Lord. So he said, Why are you calling me good? <laughs> there's only one good. He was telling him, Man, you better know who the true God is. He tells them that in this book is written the name of every individual that in that the page assigned each individual. Oh, we have a whole page. Uh, page assigned each individual is written every particular of his history, even to the numbering of the hairs of the head. He leads the human agent to think of the love of God manifested by giving his only begotten son to die. She doesn't quit, ever. Our part is to appreciate the means provided and in harmony with the divine mind work out our salvation. God could do no more to express His love. His gift could not be greater. Now, you put that one down and don't ever let it go because Jesus said, I'm going to send you the greatest gift heaven can send. Well, wait a minute. We already had the greatest gift God can send. So how could Jesus say, I'm going to send you a really great gift now? Well, he couldn't have meant more than the Father's already done. So what was Jesus saying? I'm going to send you the greatest gift that the Father already sent in another form. When I come the next time, you won't be able to see me. It's so simple. Once you see what's going on, you can't have two greatest gifts. Okay. From the Lord Jesus Christ, when in human flesh successfully resisted every temptation of the enemy. His efforts of superhuman love made to save the race were successful. From him, men and women may receive power to overcome. From who? Not somebody the Sunday keeping church is called the Holy Spirit. No, it's Jesus himself by His own personal breath, Spirit. He takes every repenting soul into covenant relation with Himself. Now, if we make it from here to here, directly to Jesus, what else do we need? What for? I've already moved from me to self, from self to Jesus. I don't need anything else. Where else is it to go? Behold, I send you the promise of my Father. What was the promise? God said, I will send you my Spirit. <laughs> That's the promise. I will send you 
the promise, the Spirit of Jesus Himself. Ah, by His heavenly gifts, the Lord has made ample provision for His people. An earthly parent can not give his child a sanctified character. He cannot transfer his character to his child. God alone can transform us. Christ breathed on his disciples. And he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. This is the great gift of heaven. Christ imparted to them through the Spirit His own sanctification. That's the Spirit we receive. Not another being, not another deity, not a third thing people call the Holy Spirit God. No! It's Jesus Himself! He says, I sanctify myself for your sakes. John 17. And He, when He breathes on us, gives us His sanctification, His Spirit, He Himself. He imbued them with His power that they might win souls. Oh, now you see why we're not getting it. People can't get the Spirit of Jesus just because they want to be Christians and say, now I have the Spirit of Jesus. He only gives it to people for one reason, to win souls. That's the reason for the Spirit of Jesus. Henceforth, Christ would live through their faculties and speak through their words. They were privileged to know that hereafter he and they were to be one. They must cherish his principles and be controlled by his spirit. They were no longer to follow their own way, to speak their own words. The words they spoke were to proceed from a sanctified heart and fall from sanctified lips. No longer were they to live their own selfish life. Christ was to live in them and speak through them. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is that the Bible message? I live in that I have a Christ live to me. Is that the Bible message? There's nothing in the Bible about Trinity. It's always about the Father and His Son, Jesus. And Jesus gives us His Spirit. His breath, as it says in the Hebrew and the Greek. Well, we could go reading on here all day long and and not find anything different. Let me give you oh some uh, quotes you can look up. ML 49.3 Our High Calling 150.2 this one is very important. Signs of the Times, March 15th, 1910. Do you see the date on that? That's a long time after Desire of Ages. This one also you will enjoy because she adds more words. Three selected, I'm sorry, three Spirit Prophecy, 242. I wanted to read that one today. We didn't get there. Testimony to Ministers 214.3 Review and Arrow July 22nd, 1884 Signs of the Times, August 26th, 1897 She says there that when God gave Jesus, He gave all heaven. That means He's the greatest gift. So whatever it is that Jesus gave us, it's not greater than that gift. Jesus gave us Himself through His Spirit, in His Spirit. 2MR13, you will want to read that whole list of articles. It's very long, but it has some really fantastic materials in a whole section. 2MR13, 
20 MR 217, 1888, page 461. And that one, she said she was a meeting. They all felt the presence of the Lord. And she said, He breathed on me. Oh, I never, can you make that say, oh, a third God came from heaven to be with me. No way, you can't do it. She says, Jesus breathed on me. Signs of the Times, October 3rd, 1892, paragraph 4. That is another outstanding quotation. All of these say what Genesis 1, 3 is saying. Breath, Ruach, Wind Spirit, and in the New Testament, Numa, Wind, Breath, Spirit. She is defining those scriptures for us. And when she's done, the only thing you can come up with is the breath, is the Spirit of Jesus. That's all there is in the Bible. Well, that should be enough, isn't it? I told a lady sitting in this chair one night, she, she couldn't hardly understand how there could not be a trinity. And so we just talked a little bit about it. And I told her, look, don't think about receiving something you don't know anything about. What good is it? You can't explain it? Forget it. Here's all you have to remember. That when you pray to Jesus and a spirit comes to you, the true spirit is Jesus himself. You, all your life in praying to Jesus, have been receiving his spirit. Don't give it away for something else. And she started crying. She got it. She said, I have been receiving Jesus the whole time. I said, yes, you've been receiving Jesus, not, not some third mysterious thing. And I think we need to talk simply like that. We need to convince them as much as they can be convinced in their heart that if they're receiving anything from God, it's Jesus himself. And if they can grasp that thought, the Lord can begin working on them and bringing the truth to them. I think maybe that does what we were supposed to do for today. Father, we thank you. Uh, when you came to us, we were able to respond. We pray that you will keep coming to us and keep showing us things. That we will continue to say, thank you, Lord. And our heart will constantly say, Amen. May we know the power of believing what you believe. May we turn our eyes, our hearts, our mind, everything away from men. May we only know your voice. And then knowing that, may we begin to sense what your kingdom is really all about. We've never seen it. We can only sense it as you come close to us. May we stay open in Jesus' precious name. Amen.